Nicholas Bornholz of Capital Link, and uh, I would like to welcome you all to the first uh, panel of, uh, of today. We kick off our conference, uh, Ted and I uh, opened the conference giving the welcome remarks, and now we are starting with uh, the first panel on dry bulk uh, sector. Uh, we have with us uh, five, uh, the CEOs of five leading dry bulk companies, and Nick Ristick, uh, the uh, lead dry bulk analyst of Bremer uh, ACMC Broking in London will moderate it. Just before coming uh, live, we were discussing amongst us that yes, we all look forward to getting back to normal where we can see each other, give a handshake, go out for dinner and have a glass of wine together or a cup of coffee. But in the meantime, I would like you to think what we are achieving in a way. Uh, we have with us people from all over the world. Uh, Nick is in London. Lucas is in Cyprus. Ulrich at this moment is uh, in Oslo. Martin is in Singapore. Stamatis is in Athens. John and I are in New York. So it's really amazing the connectivity we have all together, being able to deliver uh, a first class content to an audience that again is from all over the world. Uh, and without any more delay, I will turn it over to Nick to kick start the conversation. Thank you to everybody for being with us today. So far, it has been uh, a wonderful start. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, you know, welcome. Uh, good afternoon here from, from sunny, or not quite so sunny London. Um, and obviously, good morning for those joining from the US. Um, you know, as Nicholas was saying, this is the, the first session of the day. Um, and with us, we have a, an esteemed panel of presidents and CEOs representing some of the biggest names in the dry market. Um, and what I'm hoping to, to tease out of today's, um, today's panel is, you know, some, some of their thoughts on, you know, the biggest questions at the forefront of players' minds in the dry market. Um, and some of the differing strategies that we're seeing emerge um, in response to some of these problems. Um, so joining us, we have John Wogensmith, who's uh, president and CEO of Genco Shipping and Trading. Martin Wade, who is CEO of Grindrod Shipping Holdings. Uh, Ulrich Bernfeld Anderson, who is CEO of Golden Ocean. Uh, Lucas Barbaris, president of Safe Bulkers, And Stamatis Santanis, who is CEO of Synergy Maritime Holdings. So we've only got 40 minutes. Um, so we'll get things going fairly promptly. If we have time for questions at the end, uh, we have a we, we can have a, a brief Q and A session, but if not, then don't fear. There's a I've been told there's a digital um, networking lounge um, where you can ask you know questions directly to the panelists and talk with other attendees. So you know to kick things off, um, 2020 has been one of the most volatile years to date for the dry market. I mean, particularly for the Cape sizes, you know, where we've seen. Uh, months of, of sub opex level earnings, and then and then you know, followed by a correction to 35 grand a day spikes. Um, Stamatis, what do you see as the the drivers behind this volatility? Well, um, thank you, and nice to see you, everyone, and uh, good morning to everyone. So, 2020 has been uh, a year with extreme volatility so far. Thank you very well said, it, Nick. Uh, we had. Uh, not just sub OPEX levels. I mean, there were days that, uh, you know, we had negative uh, time charter equivalent rate. So uh, it, it was a horrendous market um, for uh, certain parts of uh, Q1 and Q2, in particular, March, April. And um, well, the problem is that it was not driven so much by the COVID-19 situation or anything like that. Demand for iron ore and coal which is the two main um, uh, commodities that we transport, has been extremely strong. Uh, the problem was from the supply of the product and especially coming out of Brazil. So uh, once that um, was uh, normalized, the market pushed very aggressively higher. So we saw uh, even in June and July, the market pushing up to $20,000 and then in spikes uh, and ranges between fifteen dollars and $35,000 a day. So demand for iron ore and coal um, has been extremely strong. And um, this is mainly driven by all nations' uh, stimulus packages that they want to invest in infrastructure and, uh, and things like that. So as long as, um, I'm personally very confident that as long 
as uh, the supply of the product continues to be uh, normalized and there are no supply disruption problems as far as the commodities are concerned, then we will see a very, very strong market going forward. So this is what has been driving the volatility. Okay. And, um, and Ulrich, what, what, what can owners do or what have they been doing to, to manage some of these downside um, and, of course, upside risks as well? Yeah, thank you, Nick, and thank you for having me uh, on the panel. Um, for Golden Ocean's uh, point of view, uh, we have applied a bit more balanced approach to our chartering. Uh, we had a rough start to the year, obviously, like, like everybody, um, but we have been very active now in securing uh, coverage when we see that the markets are about break even um, in order to manage that downside. I think we operate from a very simple perspective that we want to manage the downside by taking out contracts at, at attractive levels. Uh, and then with our last position uh, we have, we still maintain a big uh, exposure to, to, to the upside as and when it comes. And we, we uh, are also of the same view that the demand is in place and, and also now the supply. So as much as we may have a difficult first quarter, we are very optimistic in the, in the, in the medium to, uh, to longer term. Okay, thank you. And, and, and John, I mean, we touched on, on stimulus, I mean, Stamatis touched on stimulus just then. I mean, there are, of course, um, expectations of, of heavier fiscal spending around the world to, to lift economies out of recession. Um, yeah, do, do you agree that the dry market is, is well positioned to, to take advantage of those measures? Well, I think it's I think it's very well positioned, and you know let let's just go back and and through very short term history, right? We had a, a brutal late first quarter and, uh, and second quarter, uh, mainly on the back of China completely shutting down its uh, its economy and then ultimately doing the same. Um, fortunately for dry bulk, China put in place a, a very large stimulus program very early on. They were really the first uh, nation in the world to, uh, to put a put a look. And it's very comparable to the most of the post-financial crisis. But about $525 billion in the post-financial crisis was down a little bit more. They also geared that stimulus much more toward rather than focused on, uh, on housing. So, more steel, uh, more steel uh, focus, and we've seen it, right? We've seen it in the recovery in China in terms of the steel industry, we produced a record amount of steel, I think, year on year over last year. Finally, Brazil is getting the disclosure fired out after the, uh, after the dam disaster in, in early 2019. So, and then if we, if we look at Europe, I mean, Europe is putting a $2 trillion stimulus package in place. And India, while there hasn't been necessarily a ton of money in it, the steel industry has come back. So we're, we're very close now to the 2019 run rate in the Indian steel industry. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, Lucas, you are you are heavily focused on the on the Panamax market, which has seen some um, extreme moves as well. Um, you know, on one hand, you've had you know extremely reduced coal volumes, but then conversely, record volumes of grain being shipped to strong crops around the world. I mean, what do you expect for the Panama market, Panama market in the coming months? Uh, look, uh, in the, in the, I mean, we, we have faced uh, the first half of this year, which was uh, quite weak. I think that presently. The Panamax uh, to post Panamax market is uh, above break even points. Uh, we have uh, certain, uh, the price for coal is uh, quite uh, uh, high in China. There are restrictions uh, from, uh, uh, for, for imports uh, uh, to China uh, from Australia, which will uh, Let's say maybe it, it will change somehow the pattern, although there is a possibility that uh, such restrictions will be lifted as we move towards the winter. I think uh, that uh, coal is the main, uh, um, remains uh, a, a key commodity for China. So one way or the other, a Chinese will find a way to, to adapt and to import more coal in the near future. 
Okay, interesting. And and, and Martin, you know, you are obviously focused on on the smaller ships, the geared and Andes and Supers, um, who have also benefited from from the grains this year. And and China has been one of the, the bigger stars there in terms of demand. But are there any other sources of demand coming up? Um, as I mentioned back at, at the Capital Inc. conference in March, the, the, the one thing about uh, the whole corona lockdowns is that people have to eat. And uh, I think that's become very, very uh, important. Uh, there's talk about famine in, in China, which I'll get to. But ultimately, people have got to eat. And just in time, stockpiles, I think, are a thing of the past. So you're, you're now taking, you've got drought in Europe, uh, part of the Midwest. Uh, and countries are having to look at their, their stockpiles and, and move. And obviously with, with China, it's huge with the 100 year floods they've had and, and uh, 80 odd million people displaced uh, with well over 50% of their grain crops wiped out. And hence they're buying grain like it's never been seen before out of the state, which is very positive. And at the same score, it's pushing prices. And I think other countries are gonna have to get involved or are getting involved. And like all the grain trades, it's uh, Panamax downwards, long haul trades. Uh, if you take the US alone, there's some 35 million tons up on soya bean and, and corn exports set, sold at this point in time over last year. And the USDA is predicting on a close on 20 million tons at least more grain moving. So it's very, very positive. And I think you're gonna get a knock on effect with other countries having to secure grain supplies. Okay, thank you. Um... Now, I mean, at, at the forefront of, of you know, all ship owners and investors' minds um, at the moment are the you know, upcoming uh, greenhouse gas emissions legislations and other environmental legislations, I mean, which essentially require over the next decade or so, or two decades, you know, a, a complete overhaul of the dry bulk fleet um, and also you know, sources of alternative fuel. Uh, LNG is getting a lot of traction, but it's, it's far from carbon neutral and there are some other exotic fuels being discussed. Um, John, are you, are you looking at any of these? Look, I mean, we're, we're looking at quite a, quite a few things. I mean, I, I, actually, um, I actually think this is going to ultimately be positive for, uh, for, for the shipping industry, dry bulk specifically. The, um, I, 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 I think there are going to be more barriers to entry. Um, uh, being established, and so the larger, more efficient, um, capable companies will wind up winning out when all is said and done because of the uh, of the regulations. You know, we've got the Poseidon principle, so the banks are very, very focused on um, who they're dealing with and how they're moving towards 20, 2020. So I, um, I think all that is positive. You know, it's very difficult to tell them what the world is. John, John, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your, your audio is breaking up. Okay. It's weird. Yeah, just having a little bit of issues there. Sorry for that, but we'd love to hear what you have to say. Now let me pull this closer. Is that any better? That's perfect now. Okay. Well, now we have a great close-up. <laughs> I think I think we still might be having a, a bit of the issues. There. There's, there's there's a bit of feedback. Okay. How about now? That seems much better. Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. So I, I if again I I think it's keeping a nice cap on the supply of uh, ships that are being able to order because of the uncertainty going forward. Um, are we, are we still doing okay here, Nick? Yeah, it's good. So if we look at the options going forward, LNG is obviously getting a big focus right now. Um, I am not as convinced that LNG is the, the fuel of the future. Um, we, we all know that it probably reduces GHG by 15 to 20%, but there are questions on methane SNP and whether that really gets you there or not. And, you know, from our standpoint, I don't, I have a hard time building a, building a ship for 10 years from now. It, it, it's certainly obsolete because we're not getting as much guidance as I think we should from, uh, from my mind, particularly as we get to 2050. So I'm more optimistic, and again, I think a little farther off, but on ammonia and hydrogen. Ammonia on the larger ships, maybe hydrogen with, some, with you know, with a little fuel of diesel on the smaller vessels. Um, I still think we have to figure out the cost side. 
um, retrofitting possible. Um, I think the pretty cool thing about, about an ammonia engine is it's more of an add-on uh, to the existing diesel. So I think it's, I think it's a better or more viable solution in a shorter term, maybe five years out, seven years out. Um, of course, the availability of being able to bunker um, ammonia is, is one of the, uh, one of the factors. But again, I, I go back to, you know, we, we, we've really started to look at this, we started to talk to engine manufacturers, but overall for the industry, I think it's very positive. It's obviously very positive for uh, the environment in general, but um, putting more barriers to entry and, and getting this industry less fragmented, I, I think would be a good step forward. Okay, okay, and we'll, we'll touch on the, the order book later on. Um, I mean, Stamatis, what, what, what's your take on, on, on complying with the regulation that you focused on the, the new building side as well, or, or, or concentrating on you know, the second hand market, let's say? Well, first of all, I agree 100% with uh, John. I think that uh, the increased regulation uh, is going to be very favorable to um, dry bulk shipping right now, uh, because nobody in his right mind is going to place any new building orders uh, when, like John said, uh, these ships may become obsolete very, very soon. So, you know, I don't think that it's going to, um, you know, to, to add up to any new building uh, problems like we experienced in the past. But, you know, let us all uh, remember that the only way to immediately cut emissions right now has to do with the reduction of speed. So, you know, there's no way that you can retrofit the engines tomorrow. There's no way that you can apply LNGs here and there or whatsoever. But if you look at the average speed right now of the fleet, uh, some of these VLOCs and the Valemaxes are moving at 14 <laughs> knots these days. I mean, you can imagine the amount of emissions that they are uh, putting out in the atmosphere. Uh, the only immediate measure that you can do in order to reduce that is to slow down. And if you slow down the fleet, that will automatically create a big supply, vessel supply crunch that is going to show up to the rates. So it's a combination. I mean, it's going to be good for the environment, slowing down the fleet, and it's going to be good for the market because, you know, freight rates are going to go up with the uh, reduction of the effective supply of ships. So this is what I believe it has to do. As far as the imminent measures, we all know that uh, 2021 is going to be a year of, let's say, awareness where everybody's going to be putting out in a global uh, MRV uh, database uh, the amount of emissions that everybody's uh, putting out. And I think that, um, you know, we'll try and be as positive as possible. But like I said many times, like it's commonly accepted uh, everywhere in the industry, the only possible way to do an immediate effect is either to make the ships more efficient, but more efficient is like in the region of 5 6% by installing um, energy saving devices, 10% of the most. We in synergy in cooperation with uh, Cargill, we have been pioneering uh, this uh, measure by retrofitting uh, some of uh, our 2011 ships that could um, uh, install energy saving devices. But that is a cost that has, cannot be undertaken by the ship owners, the shipping mm -hmm. company. It has been undertaken in global uh, coordination uh, by the charters as well. So if everybody's serious about really reducing the emissions of the ships, you have to co-invest in energy saving devices, reduce the emission of the ships actually by putting some energy saving devices on both ships. Five or 10% on a cape size actually makes material difference. We're talking about 4,000 tons of CO2 emissions a year less. You know, if you make it up by 15, 1,700 ships, you can imagine what is the impact. But you know, the energy saving device and the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions cannot be done if the ship owners pay the price again, like we did, or a lot of people did with the scrubbers. It has to be in coordination and in cooperation with the charters. So it's extremely important that if everybody's serious about reducing the greenhouse emission, you have to co-invest, reduce the speed, and install energy saving devices on board the ship. This is our thesis. Mm. Okay, interesting. I mean, stay, staying on this topic, um, I mean, wh what it seems like is that the, the regulatory you know, landscape is becoming more and more um, fragmented, if you like. I mean, we've got several players, players um, most up in the ante when it comes to back decarbonisation measures, for example, several um, 
signatories of the the Sea Cod Charter. Um, Martin, what do you think you know, ship owners as a group need from these industry bodies and, and to an extent charters to properly prepare for the, the rules coming down the pipeline? In a couple of words, unity and consensus. Um, we need clarity and clear direction. 90% of everything moves by sea with the most efficient means of transport. However, legislation is hurtling at us at a rapid rate of knots. And if we don't change legislation, particularly from Europe, is going to come and hit us. We've got to be radical. IMO, it takes five years for them to, to table a motion to, to get it passed. Does it have to be someone like BIMCO, represents 60% of the world's owners already? It's going to have to be radical. And I think, to be blunt, it's probably going to be a carbon tax. And that way you will differentiate between ships. And of course, in theory, that works. So the charters will look at it and will take the better ships. But as we all know with, uh, with some of our charterers, all they'll do is take the cheapest ship if it's cheap enough. So I think in terms of this, uh, ESG has got to come into it and performance has to be in both owners and charterers. And it's got to be up there. We've really got to clean up this industry. And the only way we're going to get new technology, I, I love, and I agree with what everyone said, but it's always down to the ship owner, isn't it? We're the ones that have to change, but we never get paid for it. Yards are supposed to produce ships so we can have cheaper and cheaper freight, but it's not going to happen. If we are going to save the world, then we need a better market. And we keep on, you know, when not, not many ships are being ordered, but tell you what, why don't you just ban all ships? Uh, no more new buildings after 2022 with existing engines and not like and ban all ships over 20 years we've got to get into a position forcing the industry and in turn going to europe going to other countries and, and saying we are changing and higher freight rates but gets higher new building prices and yes ammonia john correct and then it's going to be hydrogen i think it's inevitable we just have to be put in a position but expecting the owners to do it continually it just isn't going to work and all the so-called charters out there, all the ones that will be on the front page of trade wins, as soon as there's a, some green initiative, we're all signed up. It's the same people that take the dirtiest, oldest ship at the cheapest freight rate. We know that. We have to change. And if we don't, Europe and other countries are going to legislate, and then we're in a mess. So it's got to be radical. Very interesting. Thanks. Um, I mean... Uh, some, some of some of you know the signatories of these of, of the cargo charts, for example, are um, big players in the grain market. Um, Lukas, are you are you seeing some of their, some of this, this mindset like um, have an effect on on strategies in the Panama sector? Could you please repeat because the so so some some of this sentiment towards you know decarbonizing the market and some of the Grain charter is a, a, a very, very big on this. Are you seeing it have an effect in the Panama market immediately? Yes. Uh, I, I'll tell you my thoughts on that. Uh, my view is that uh, uh, despite the fact that we know the other fuels, which is uh, hydrogen and ammonia, etc., I don't believe that uh, such fuels will come uh, so quickly as some people may expect. Uh, so, and because of the availability of uh, LNG as a fuel globally, I, I think LNG will play a very important role in the next, let's say, two decades. Uh, I consider that uh, uh, what we see as uh, CO2 reduction, uh, which is right now in the phase three, uh, which is in 2023 goes to 30%. It used to be 10%. Then 20, compared to the uh, emit, compared to the emissions in back in 2008, and then it went to 20%. Now the phase three vessels will have a uh, 30%. Maybe in 2030 it will be 40%, and gradually towards 50%. Uh, I think that. Uh, Having a good design of vessel which is about 30% uh, in compliance with the phase three, uh, if you, let's say, limit a little bit the speed uh, of such vessel and also have a dual engine fuel, uh, you can go easily to more than 40%. So I, I think the solution in the future, the, the intermediate solution, as we all call it, is. Uh, LNG plus uh, a little bit of a lower 
uh, speed. Uh, I think that uh, uh, people uh, are becoming more and more aware in relation to to fuel, uh, you know, to CO2 emissions. Uh, and I, I think that uh, we should all join the forces. I definitely agree with Martin that we should not uh, allow always all the burden to ship owners, uh, which is, uh, let's say, the, I mean, the, the normal uh, uh, victims uh, historically. So you install ballast water treatment and scrubbers, uh, then uh, compliant fuel, etc., etc., and you continue with phase uh, three and then reduction of. Uh, uh, improvement of efficiency of vessels, etc. And uh, all this leads to specific uh, expenditure. However, having said that, I think that at the end of the day, uh, we see vessels going to a lower speed in the future, which will be beneficial. We'll see some interruption in terms of technologies. So I think that uh, the market will benefit uh, from that. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, and I I mean, staying, staying, staying on this topic um, in, the, in the short term, uh, we've seen some companies place uh, a focus on digitalization uh, as a way of improving efficiency and, and also reducing operating costs. I mean, Ulrich, I know that you're a big proponent of this. Would you like to, to elaborate? Yeah, that's one of my, one of my favorite topics. Um, I think my view is that in Golden Ocean, uh, we have achieved to a very large extent, the economies of scale uh, that are available to us. We are a big company in our own right. We are on top of that, part of uh, the e, I would say the, the sea tankers ecosystem, the John Fredrickson groups of vessels, which allows to push down cuts uh, uh, to yeah, across the, across the we can say, our operation. On top of that, we are with the uh, Figura in a bunker procurement setup making us one of the largest uh, purchaser of, uh, of bunkers in the world. So that all can drive down cost and it's good. But what we see now, the next big, what can you say, step and where the, 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 the low hanging fruits are is to drive down the cost further via digitalization. And what we are working with in Golden Ocean uh, to make it a bit tangible, we're working on several projects, but, but we don't have time for that, but, but to mention one is that we are working with the ambition of what can you say, turning the vessels from analog to digital so obviously the more data that you have on your vessels, the better you can optimize your operation. Uh, I can give you an example, I like to compare it to, to, to your car and your own fuel economy. How do you get the best fuel economy uh, from your car? That depends, it depends if you're going uphill, if you're going downhill, if it's cold or if it's hot, if, uh, if uh, what engine you have, uh, what quality of fuel you have in your car, etc. And it's no different from a vessel except that it's even more complicated because we have fouling, we have a market we need to take into consideration as well. Uh, we have uh, market and future expectations, et cetera. But if you combine all of this data into algorithms, you can start calculating your optimal speed. And that can be down to a matter of being speeding 12.1 versus 12.2 knots to achieve the best fuel economy on that particular vessel, on that particular voyage. And uh, of course, uh, what can you say? The, the savings here, we are talking about our immense. I think we bought it this year with around $120 million in bunker cost in Golden Ocean alone. And a reduction of five to 10%, which we don't think is unreasonable, uh, is obviously a real significant reduction of cost. And then of course, at the same time, it's also a reduction of emissions. So these are changes that move the needle, uh, both for what can you say, uh, uh, your cost base, but also for taking down emissions at the same time. So for us, digitalization is now where we need to make the next big push uh, forward. Okay, and and I mean, obviously, this approach works when you have a quite a large, you know, diversified fleet. Uh, jo John, are you are you also looking at similar measures on your ships? Yeah, no, we are, and and you know, Ehrlich did a very very good job of laying out, you know, sort of why there's there's such a focus on digitalization right now. What what we have gone from is. Previously, we were really doing a look backward. So we were gathering information off of our ships, running software, but it wasn't real time. So where, where, we, where we've gone over the last 24 months is we've invested CapEx, we're installing uh, flow meters, trim, uh, trim sensors on our ships so that we're getting real time data now. And we have set up um, alarms, if you will, for all of our operations um, that when something gets outside of parameters that we've set, 
we know right away. We don't have to wait a week before we, we look at data. This is all coming in real time now. Um, and then obviously, as Norwick said, we can take the data and, and slice it many different ways and, and make adjustments to the future. But to me, the real thing is a real time focus on what your kids are doing. And Sorry, John, you're, you're cutting off again. I think. Yeah, okay. Real time data, that's the important part. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so I mean, we, we touched on, on the order book and, you know, the, the relatively limited number of shifts on order for the next few years. I think we've got 7% of the dry bulk uh, on order in dead weight terms, which is the lowest since since the late 80s. Um, and we, we, we talked about how, um, you know, uncertainty over regulation is, is part of the cause there. Um, but Stamatis, I mean, do you see any other, any other things keeping, keeping owners away from, from investing in new ships? Well, um, we recently bought um, a second hand ship, uh, a ship that was uh, built in 2005, uh, high quality Japanese uh, second hand vessel. We really believe as a company that there is excellent value in this kind of uh, asset classes because um, you know, if you choose the right uh, second hand candidate, then you can automatically convert it um, into a certain strong um, return for the shareholder. So uh, we would not consider, of course, any uh, such thing as new buildings or things like that. We think there's very good value in uh, vessel categories between, uh, let's say, seven, eight, and um, 14, 15 years old of age. There's no particular premium in getting into a very modern ship other than uh, other elements, which is impossible to amortize over uh, a long period of time. So generally what we've done as a company is that uh, we have uh, recently bought a ship. We're looking to acquire additional companies uh, right now that we think is going to give a good and steady return um, to our shareholders. So basically this is where I see the value. I mean, uh, that particular acquisition that we did alone, um, we agreed uh, to buy that ship uh, in May, that was the early May, I think, which was the absolute bottom of the market. We took delivery of that ship in July, right when the market started pushing to $30,000 a day. And right now, in its first voyage, that ship is making a big portion of its total acquisition price, just in one ship, and just in its uh, first voyage. So uh, there's strong volume to that, uh, sorry, there's a very strong value to that, and we will continue pursuing uh, this kind of uh, uh, investments. Okay, and, and I mean, complying with, with previous, you know, sets of regulation, for example, you know, the ballast water treatment, uh, you know, ballast water treatment requirements and an IMO 2020 have been, have been quite expensive. I mean, Martin, do you see that also limiting the amount of capital available for, for renewal? Very much so. Obviously, we, uh, we, we didn't go the scrubber route, but... Um, Purely from a selfish non-scrubber perspective, the, was it three, four or five billion dollars that was spent on scrubbers that could have gone to new buildings. Thankfully, it didn't. So, yes, I think well, we've had, what, nine really bad years in dry cargo. Let's hope. Uh, predict, confident predicted that this year was going to be better until Corona. Going forward, the yards don't know what to build. Owners don't know what to build. If we're going to get anywhere close to the regulations for 2030, we could... You order a new ship, it could be defunct in, in 10 years. Then you have the banks, Western banks basically gone. Even the leasing companies are getting far more picky. Um, we actually have the, the perfect storm at, at the moment. So um, there is no incentive to build new ships because ultimately, no matter how eco they are, it could still be something that, that's defunct. So as Tomata said, plenty of value in second hand. Obviously, we've we, we, we only run Japanese, it's there that the quality and they last. So uh, maybe, never say never, we'll tell you what, Nick, we, we, we get a booming market for two years and all the lemmings will reappear and we go again, yes. But tell you what, I think the rest of us, if we have a booming market for a couple of years, we'll, we'll, we'll take a view on that. But at the moment, there is no incentive. I just can't see anyone doing it. Okay, no, I mean, it, it really does seem like a, um, a unique period where, you know, previously when we've got to this stage, we've seen a, a spurt borders but we haven't to date um now th there are some other there are some other issues going on in the market i mean or in, in fact we, we've only got five minutes um remaining uh, we can take some questions from the audience uh, if anybody wants to to submit any
Oh, you, you have one from Morten Aronson. I don't know if you got yeah. that. I'm just, I'm just opening it up now. Okay, so we have a question from Morten Aronson. Um, all of the panelists run companies uh, which have mostly generated losses in the last 10 years and have not returned your cost of capital. Uh, what changes are you going to make to your business models to change this and attract investors that demand profits and cash flow? Does anyone like to take this? Uh, if I can say some comments on this, uh, we all know that uh, dry bulk shipping uh, mainly produces uh, uh, losses for several years and maybe there are two or three years that are very good and, uh, and uh, there we can recover and uh, have, let's say, uh, and accumulate uh, some uh, fat for the next uh, crisis. So the, the market is cyclical. Uh, what a prudent management uh, should do is uh, to be able to maintain uh, its liquidity, the company's liquidity during uh, a, a bad uh, I mean, uh, during the bad period of time and be prepared through, through the good period. And uh, if uh, this happens, uh, it means that the company is ready to, to do whatever it's, it's the right thing to do each time. So, for example, sometimes you may need to, to buy a second-hand vessel. Sometimes you may need to uh, adapt to new technologies like the ones that we see in 2020-2013, in 2023. Uh, the important thing for us as company is that uh, we have the liquidity uh, and we maintain the liquidity through, the, the, through this uh, crisis that we are passing. The market right now is good and we can see all opportunities ahead of us. Uh, and the second important thing is that uh, for investors is uh, the dilution. And uh, just as an example to say is that despite the fact that uh, we, had an, uh, we have in place an ATM. We never uh, use this ATM at these uh, very low levels, and we don't intend to do it at, at such uh, low levels. So if you have a management which has about 50% uh, of the company, and the public shareholders feel that uh, they, this management is aligned uh, with the trust, uh, you can uh, go through the cycles, and at the end of the day, there will be the time that uh, the money will be produced, maybe in, in one or two or three years. Yeah, Nate, can I also ask, oh, yeah, sorry, um, I haven't been in a dry cargo for 10 years, so I cannot take responsibility for, for, for all the bad years, uh, only, only the recent losses. But what I think is important to understand here is that we are now moving shipping from a, what can you say, carbon intensive model onto a zero emission model. So what is happening now in the, at the moment on decarbonization is massive. We cannot underestimate it. It will impact investor side, finance, customers, employees, asset values. In that transition, there's going to be plenty of differentiation and uh, optionality, you can say, and possibilities for the owners. I think that complexity that comes into the model now will allow us to be less of a price taker in the future. Uh, and that should be for the companies that grab this opportunity, uh, be a, a possibility of attracting more value out of our models. Okay, thank you very much. I, mean, I think we've got time for one more very quick question. Uh, we have here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, with the carbon footprint so high on the CEO's and board's agenda, how much of your variable compensation is linked to reducing your company's emission? Uh, John, would you like to take that? Um, so look, I mean, obviously, uh, well, at least from uh, from Genco, um, we uh, we have a large part of our of our compensation in uh, in stock. Um, hopefully, Nick, you can you can now hear me again. Yeah. Uh, good. Um, and uh, so that that carbon footprint, and, and I think investors are starting to differentiate more and more on the ESG side. So not not just the, the environment and social issues, but also the governance. And and as you know, we have very high uh, governance standards and very high in in uh, in Weber's uh, annual uh, survey. Um, so and we also have a full KPI system. Um, so we have five different buckets of KPI and. Uh, you know, uh, efficiency is in one of them. So I wouldn't say there's anything specific yet, but I do believe that that is coming. Okay, thank you very much. I, I think I think that is you know, all we have time for for today. Um, I thank our thank our panelists.
Um, and of course, you know, we have the, the digital networking lounge where, where questions can be asked to, to the panelists and you know, share a, a digital beer. Um, so, um, so again, thank you very much. And, uh, yeah. see you all soon. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. See you guys. Take care.